So uh, we wanted to discuss uh, pods, or really we started discussing discussing the naming, but uh, but then there are all these questions that come up about okay, forget the name, or as Shakespeare said, what's in a name? Um, what actually happens with the implementation of pods and its impact on different features and functionality? I don't know if we know to answer that yet, but my kind of question and concern comes with how we are going to define the separation between pods because I saw Camille's POC and uh, it looks like if something is on different pods, you can basically not see it and you can't do anything with resources in between pods. Um, and, and the question is, is that interpretation correct or are we going to do some limbo weirdness where we can share some resources in some way or or is like no not at all or are we going to find some ways and the reason I ask that is because there's different concerns around group sharing permission sharing um, another question I had for example is from the user point of view like if I'm a if I'm a user that I belong to both an organization, ACME, and also I'm a community contributor, how do I see my things? Like what happens to my notifications, to my to-dos? So like one of the things that users complain about, for example, is, oh, I don't see my private contributions on my uh, contribution calendar, for example. What happens in all those situations? So that's kind of the some questions floating around in my mind. Well, we can go through all of them one by one, and um, I, I can already tell you that we most certainly don't have the answers to all of those things, and I'll, I'll take a few steps back. I think the, let me outline briefly how we arrived at this point and what we're doing right now, because I think that's important for you to understand, because um, I think there may be a perception that um, this is all a done deal and things are just happening and you have to deal with it, which is not the case. So maybe the first thing regarding naming, because what's in a name, but naming is notoriously hard, right? So I actually personally think this bucket that we opened on the naming concerns, I don't think that needs to block making that decision on names. And I think that's important because you, otherwise we're going to spin in circles for a long time. So that's at least my perception. Um, so I'm happy once we have this naming thing out of the way, um, because it, I think unblocks remote development as well. So that's number one. The second, the second thing is like, why are we even talking about pods, right? And I think this is something I, I wanted to briefly outline. I spoke to Marcel, but I think Chris, we haven't met yet. Um, I'm at least going to give you the overview. The reason why we are at this point is more than a year ago, we were in um, quite a bit of trouble with regards to our gitlab.com architecture. Um, and we knew already at that point that we needed to do something um, in order for us to actually continue to scale and not topple over. And that is a big company-wide risk, right? If gitlab.com can't actually, like essentially becomes unstable, you know, unavailable, and we can't scale it anymore, that's a big business risk. And so at that time, we already did some investigation of what to do and arrived at CI decomposition, taking all of the CI tables and moving them to a separate database cluster as a first iteration, which already took us almost a year to do. And we've done it, I think in July, and that's done. But we already knew that this is only the first step. So it's not like we did it and now we are indefinitely fine. So we have certain business goals. I'm not going to go into detail, so we can hopefully make this public. But we know that ultimately we want to be able to scale GitLab.com and we want GitLab.com to be reliable um, for our customers. And the current architecture as it exists is very likely not going to deliver this. We're still doing other things to make it better. For example, partitioning CI tables, you know, there's a lot of optimization and, and other work going on. So pause is not the only thing here, but we know we need something, let's say within a few years. And so we sat down and sort of discussed a few options and pods seemed like the, 
the best path, potential path forward, you know, at the time. But, and I think this is important, this goes to where we are, this is really, really complex. As in the discussions that we've had with Christina and Mike on sharing and whatnot are very likely not going to be the only discussion that we're going to have because there are many parts of GitLab that are being impacted. And so what we did first is we actually created a few POCs just to understand sort of the technical feasibility of pods, ignoring some of the, the feature impact, essentially just trying to figure out if this is even sort of engineering wise possible. And I think we're now at the point where we have a few POCs, we've understood a few things that we need to do in the, in the back end. Maybe there's some work to do. And what Camille and others have started now is actually outlining the impacted features. And we are thinking about, given that if pods is a thing, that's, let's say, two years off, how do we even get there? And what are some of the prerequisites and constraints that actually come with this? And that is why we essentially said, OK, one of the big constraints that comes out of pods is that things will live on different parts and they will be physically separate from each other. And maybe this is sort of my oversight. The reason why we're kind of talking to, to the workspace group first is because we started thinking about where we, we have this plan of like sort of some harmonizing the user experience between self-managed and, and gitlab.com. And we're trying to create a concept of a workspace that's going to group things, right? And we also knew that if we just look at top level groups and we disconnect things at the top level group level, that's going to be pretty bad. So we're kind of thinking about possible solutions. And then I started reaching out to, um, to Christina and Mike to understand what workspaces are, if they are going to potentially solve some of those concerns or not. And I think where we are at the moment is they're not really going to solve all of those concerns, but maybe some of them, and it's complicated. This is where uh, I think we, we are at the moment, uh, but we don't have all of the answers to any of this. But I also, my intent, and I think the intent of group pods is to have those conversations early, right? To gather people's input and gather like their concerns rather than spending a year implementing pods and saying like, this is happening, go deal with the fallout, right? Because I'd rather have a, an overview of the impact, the trade-offs that we're making, and then coming to actually sort of a product-wide decision that this is something that we believe is potentially worth it. So this very long summary, I'm going to stop talking, but Camille and Barry can tell me if I forgot something or if I'm, if I'm wrong. I, I have a question, <laughs> maybe it's, uh, yeah, I'm not sure, uh, but a pod something that everyone would live on, like every GitLab user would be on a pod or is it something you just envision for enterprises? I don't know if that question makes sense, but it's like, is it does it make sense. Yeah. So um, at least for GitLab.com, I think eventually like end state now, not talking about the migration, right in at an end state everybody would be on pods how we get to that is um, a, a very different question um, it's very likely that um, you can you can kind of imagine let's say gitlab.com as it is right now like a single massive pod and maybe over time we can move people off that pod somehow so we'll get smaller and smaller and smaller and then at some point it may fully disappear or become just um, a regular thing that we maintain. Given that GitLab.com has been online for you know, a decade plus, there's always going to be sort of a bottom bit where we don't even know what this is, right? And it will become hard to do something about it. But my, let's say in five years or something, maybe it's gone. I don't know. Okay. I, I would probably add to that that like if we follow like the organization model and, and this is like 
the idea that let's say that we would agree on with the separation. I think like there are two main aspects. Like first aspect, um, dog fooding. I think we should move us first away from the pot zero because we are probably like 30% of the capacity used on the GitLab.com. So it would already relieve so much pain of GitLab.com. Uh, but then we like create incentive for people and existing companies to transfer into organization. Hey, this is like, this is your organization. It's isolated from the rest. Do you really want to do it? Or do you want to work in the old style in the, let's say the current GitLab.com as it was running? So, so this may be like, um, like two types of the decision. One that is like by us, but second we like, providing incentive for the customers, for them to uh, move into organization model, because then if we have these like smaller entities, we could actually migrate them away from the GitLab.com into something providing superior uh, stability. Because I think like the, the thing that we think about the pods right now, it's like every single pod would be completely self-sufficient. It would have its own runner, it would have its own queues, it would have its own elastic search. So technically, if you would have like the, the smaller organization on another pod, you can, kind of could provide actually significantly better SLAs and resiliency for, for those people and much better guarantees like how their data are being managed. So uh, I, I would kind of consider like if the organization model with the isolation becomes acceptable, I would consider these two things probably be essential. Basically first doing that for ourselves and then kind of creating incentive for existing GitLab.com users to migrate into this model. But I would not say that it would happen forcefully. Uh, it seems pretty disruptive. So I would say that this would rather be a conscious decision of the, of the companies doing that. And also very likely, at least in my head, in the initial period, it would probably be a revertible decision to make. So let's say you choose the isolation, you have like 90 days for go back if, it, if you figure out that this is something that is not working for you. Uh, so at least, at least this is how I would envision that from the, from the product side, if we follow isolation model that is currently proposed in the pods. The biggest open question to me, as a designer, I'm a very visual person and I want to walk through these new ideas in my head. And right now, even after we talked, I came into new ideas. I came into new kinds of state situations. And I was like, how would this work if we had pots? And I'm, I'm not sure if A, we all are aware of all of the different flows currently and b also if we all are talking about the same kind of mental idea about what pods is and what it would how it would impact the ux and the ui in our head and i think this is what we learned in the initial phases of workspace when we talked about very complex large infrastructure and information architecture ideas on on all of GitLab, it's just so complex that without something visual in front of us, it's so tough to to be aligned. I think this is this is a really valid concern. We certainly see this right now. Um, I I think if we take a step back um, from this specific concern, this is also going to be true for Gitly for other things, right? So we've already started doing some POCs on our end just to make it a little bit more visual what this would look like. For example, the demo that Camille did, but right? I think that Orit watched because it makes everything already much more clear what this would do. But, and I think this is something that um, is more for me and Barry and to some extent Ori to align on, all of this is work, right? It's like, this is something where sometimes we as in group parts can't do this necessarily because we don't know every single bit of GitLab. So one of the suggestions that I'm having or like that we are trying to put forth is we are, I think, at the point where 
let's say a pod architecture from the backend things is plausible. It's a ton of work, but it's potentially plausible. But now we are, we've discovered all of these potentially impacted features and it may be necessary, let's say for all affected groups, you know, in a quarter, you know, via some kind of method to cover out a little bit of time and actually do these types of explorations to be able to give a good evaluation. Because I think otherwise it will remain too abstract. And I think what we can do is, as in we group pods, is maybe sort of put up a few sort of leading constraints and say, these are the constraints under which pods would operate. You know, how, how does that impact your, um, your bits and pieces? And then that, that may help. But I, I don't feel comfortable just doing this right now, you know, because it is potentially disruptive. Um, but I think you are, you are correct, it's hard. And yeah, we're, we're jumping around a little bit the, the agenda. This is Orit's meeting to some extent, so I want to make sure that she gets to get as many questions of her answered as possible. Oh, um, uh, the team is more important than I am. I'm just the facilitator. So I'm, I'm happy for people to be asking their questions. Um, mine is kind of just around the same question that I asked in the beginning because it's still not sitting. Um, but I don't want to jump around the agenda. So I'm a little bit lost. I think we're somewhere in B, <laughs> Chris or Christina. Uh, I think we should follow the agenda so that, you know, we, we have a clear direction <laughs> of the meeting. Cool. Then I think we're probably at least writing in 2B, 2, like IIA, you know, for Camille. Yeah, my question was, but I guess it's related to how Orit phrased it. So I put your question in the beginning, Orit. Uh, what happens, like pods are separated. We see them as very isolated structures, but how would that impact when people want to collaborate in an organization, for instance? What if I have an external contractor or a guest user from another organization that wants to work with me? How would that look in a pod? So I think Camille tried to answer that there. I, I guess there's like a few different uh, ideas there, right? First, I think it's like um, organizational membership. We already have like the concept of external contributors. So, so maybe this was actually like evolving to uh, explicitly adding person to a group. I mean, we already have that. So it's I guess it's no different um, like to, to how you like manage existing um, members of a group. Um, probably we like it's about the forking model. The current forking model is pretty permissive. You can fork into your personal namespace, even private project. But now like it's kind of organizational model. It raises like a few questions, like one that I outlined at like organization provides like a strict control and like strict boundaries. This is like desirable that you really can fork uh, private project outside of the organization, if this is not the desire. Uh, it's completely different to the public projects and maybe uh, forks for the public projects. Maybe this is actually like a implemented as a federated merge request features that I know that some people actually ask for uh, for some time. So um, I think we don't have conclusive answer. It's, it's more like we have, a, like we actually started Let's say we put a headline for this week for us to start about the forks. We didn't yet started doing that. Uh, but I, I think it kind of opens a few possible paths for us to explore um, how to deal with the forks and the, I guess in the contributions in the general. And, um, and maybe like forks implementation, uh, maybe if you contribute within an organization, there's like some automated created space for your contributions within organization that is still managed by the organization. So kind of moving away from forking into personal, maybe if this is like the public, maybe you fork into personal project and it kind of works as a federated, maybe it's actually implemented as a federated match because it can actually work within the same GitLab, within the same pods or maybe within different GitLab instances. 
there is like plethora of different options how we can apply that. And um, I, I don't have an answer. I'm just kind of throwing the ideas to kind of think like what else we could actually offer if we have this like isolation and, and what other problems we, we could solve based on like the controls and what people expect. So I think like at least my goal right now for at least forks, because I think this is like the key headline feature that we need to figure out. And, and then like it's much easier to talk about how actually are possible approaches to these much harder cross-talking problems um, could give us like some hints of the possible designs. Because um, I think or if you ask initially like we do this strong isolation, there is no communication with pods. It's not true. We, we're not gonna avoid cross-talking to pods. It's just, it's gonna be super more complex to do it than doing that through database, how we're doing it now, because you're gonna have to use a proper API to, to like to fetch data from another pod. But um, I, I would not say that this is, it will not happen. It will for sure happen for some features because it's like inevitable. We're gonna be sharing data across cluster at these user sessions. And we definitely gonna be have to some data aggregate across cluster. It's just, I, I think the default is like, there is no cross talking. So I think it, uh, at least in the current proposal is like, if you want to do cross talking, it has to be implemented uh, using a well-defined API, probably GraphQL or, or whatever else to, to do this intra-communication. But it would never be forbidden. It's because we're gonna have some cross talking always. It's just gonna be more expensive and, and more complex to do. Uh, so I think forks could be like a good example to show how different approaches could be applied with cross talking or maybe without cross talking. Taking some of these, uh, let's say, new opportunities with the organization in mind of like stick track access control maybe slightly different uh, contributions to public, maybe federated MRs. At least this is like three or four ideas that I have in my head right now. And I can comment on this a, a little bit further. And I think this is an important, it pops up uh, later on for Orit as well. I think it's not like communicating with pods is impossible, right? And will com be completely forbidden. It's just going to be significantly more expensive to do these type of operations, right? So if you require real-time updates or complex joins, right, these kinds of things, that's going to be undesirable from in that architecture, right? Because it's slow, it's not going to work really well. But if you have things that where you know being eventually updated is acceptable, right? Or it can be a little bit slower, that's a possibility. But I think the, the idea is that the more interconnectivity we have between these pods, the less independent they are from each other and then if we realize we need to have that interconnectivity for everything right then maybe that architecture becomes not as good a fit for this right and that's a that's a thing to keep in mind as well so but for example updating a user graph right i don't think somebody is expecting a, or like would be terribly upset if it took three seconds to update a little thing over here in the contribution graph, but it really would depend on the on the feature. And I think the default would be it breaks, right? And then the question is, do, does it need to be fixed? Right? That, that's, a, that's an open question. And I think the other, the other question here around like external contractors, I think this is also something, and I tried to articulate that yesterday, I think we know that we will have to make certain trade-offs, right? And some use cases for GitLab may be significantly less common, or they may not be something that we prioritize as a company. And I think there, it may be more acceptable to say like, well, yeah, that's, that's harder or not how we work. But of course, there are some workflows like forks or whatnot, where we already know they're super, super important. And we, we need to make sure they continue to work. I think that's, that's something where I, I don't have a great idea, you know, for this specific one, but I think that is something that we would have to look at as well. Yeah, so on the topic of contractors, just to uh, kind of make life more complicated, we have large customers 
who own several companies, I'm not going to name names so that we can make this public, that will have 10,000 users or more. Um, I'm not even sure that they would roll up to a single organization because they are multiple companies. Um, and they would probably need to share data uh, either from an executive standpoint or a contractor standpoint. And just another use case for this, partners, our partners, GitLab partners, they also do like some kind of self-hosting where they host other organizations that shouldn't probably talk to each other. Um, I wonder how we're gonna address those as well. Yeah, I think that's a great question. Um, a couple of thoughts on that one. I, I think this is something where we also need to do a better job. It's like, I don't think companies with external contractors in the 10K range are necessarily a target for um, our shared multi-tenant SaaS service, right? This is maybe something where dedicated is much more suitable um, for them. So I think we also have to maybe think about, is there you know, a recommended range? But it is also the case you know, that for self-managed customers or for dedicated, we may run into exactly that problem and would have to figure out how to actually handle this. Because right now, I think I know of a few customers that have 10 GitLab instances, but right? they're disconnected from each other and they want to maybe aggregate them. And I think this is maybe something where a pod architecture would potentially even be beneficial to a certain extent, because you could imagine that having, rather than having them completely separate and no ability to roll them up, you would be able to have your own pod architecture deployed with an organ, like a part of your organization over here in a specific region and another one over here. So I could see that being potentially beneficial, but I, I agree that we may have to like, and this is a concern I think I've heard from Gabe and maybe from Mike, I'm not quite sure that, okay, so organizations is good enough for the 99%, but then there are maybe enterprises and they have different organizations and where does that end, right? And I think that's a discussion that we, we need to make. And I'm, I'm not sure that we are addressing that with, um, at the moment, particularly. Those are a couple of thoughts. Okay. Um, so in all our discussions, we've been talking about organizational isolation. We have organization mm -hmm. one, organization two. Uh, I am assuming that this also impacts users if we have isolation. And does that mean that people would need to have multiple accounts? For the yeah, business? great question. I think it will, or right, Camila, cut you off. Go for it. No, you did not. I think the whole design goal was like, um, you have a single account for the GitLab.com. You can have as many organizations as you want. Maybe in the organization you have, let's say, organization-specific profile that describes your whole title, whatever. Uh, but you should not have to create many accounts. I, I, I think this is like the headache of the current GitLab.com. And, um, and I, I think that also like sit, serve, serve to us like as one of the design goals that like, on github.com, you need to have right now a personal and professional account to segregate duties. I think the, the POTS architecture with the organization is like tries to avoid that at all costs. It's usually basically have be able to interact between many organizations, switch between them, do not know that you are on a POT 100. From your perspective, it's important what you are interacting with. That's it, not Fabian, you, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> oh, I, I think that's true. Um, this, on a technical level, right, this may actually, what this may require is taking everything that has to do with authentication and users and isolating that out of GitLab to make it some kind of global service, which is actually desirable for a number of different reasons, security, for example, right? Um, and others, but we we are not, at least in our current plans, you know, the, the design goal was to have some shared state and users would be would be one of them. Um, and that's of course a single point of failure, right? If you use the service goes down, then you're shna boozled. But um, that's that's our thinking. Did that address your question? It did. 
Um, I think you have point number three, Fabian. Um, I think um, I will just move this at the top because I talked about it essentially in the beginning. That's just the background information on where we are. I vocalized that. Um, yeah, number five, I briefly mentioned this. Um, and I think this is in line with what Marcel um, articulated. Given the complexity of all of this, and given that you know there is a lot to unpack, I think the next step here may be to say, look, this is you know from a pulse perspective, you know this is the technical architecture. You know these are some of the constraints. These are the impacted features. Do an evaluation of the impact, um, but I, I would want that to be aligned on in terms of company priorities because that could take some effort right and i i think we've already seen that um, if i enter a room and mention pods and what it could do you know people are generally a little bit okay this changes everything what are we going to do here and so that that may be the the learning that i'm taking from having taken up some uh, some time in in the uh, in other groups but that's not a definite thing, right? I don't know. I would like to align on that with engineering and product leadership and at least make that suggestion. Um, that's my thinking. I wonder how that came, that happened. You came in and just, we had to change the naming. I know. It's, uh, I feel, I feel um, I've had at least some impact. I'm not going to be the judge if it's going to be good or bad, but um, it's what it is. Um. Okay, so I'm going back to my original question because I think this one is really important to uh, understand how we're discussing this and how are we defining isolation? Is it like separate instances? Um, I'll, I'll let you talk about it as well. So I think the, um, the idea is that um, pods should be mostly isolated, but pods will host many organizations. And anything that happens within a pod can essentially continue to operate as it does right now. But anytime a feature, whatever that is, needs to cross into something that is not located on the same pod, then, um, you know, that, let's say, would break unless we fix it. And so the, um, the idea is, I think, from our perspective, that pods is a potentially good fit if we are treating isolation sort of as a default, and then we make exceptions in cases where we believe that that needs to be, needs to be done or where that makes sense. And some of the things are, you know, for example, search, if we ever wanted to search across everything um, or like things that are maybe like or forks, you know, that we just discussed. Um, that's the that's the idea. But the des this is desirable because let's say um, a large like a number of customers are on a specific pod and they do something, but right? they um, sometimes that happens. Let's say they uh, or let's say the the data center burns down, right? Then that pod goes offline, we have disaster recovery capabilities, the entire fleet continues to work. That's not the case at the moment, right? Somebody does something on gitlab.com, it's, uh, it's a problem. This is why that's uh, desirable. Anything to add, Camille? Probably like two things. Uh, one thing like, um, it's something that we are also discussing, but pods architecture should probably effectively uh, reduce the usage of staging and canary because maybe we could actually upgrade pods at different rate based on the customer tiers. Basically, if we are on the pod, we get up in, on the pod 100, we can actually make ourselves be upgraded first to validate before the rest of the pods. Of course, there is like a com complications of the compatibility, but uh, pods architecture offers these different rates. Um, second thing, um, 
the, the idea of the organization is like that organizations are built on the current architecture and pods would benefit from the organization isolation. Uh, and, and this is, I think, like that something that would be kind of prerequisite uh, to, to the pods because uh, what you saw as a POC was like uh, organization equals pot. It's not something that how, that we could run. So I, I think like the idea was like that the POC should provide this kind of level of the isolation, just using single using the single GitLab and the and the organization model. So something that could be done. Uh, replicated onto many pods and kind of provide multi organization per pod. So this would be my second note. But but this is like following the design if we follow the design yeah. after all the trade offs. So um, the idea would be like that organization is being built first on top of existing, started to be rolled out, um, and only then we can actually use pods to, to uh, share, I mean, sorry, like balance resources used by the different organizations. Yeah, that's I think the, the my high level migration idea that we had is that we, you know, we have to kind of figure that out first. And then once it's in place, we can actually start, for example, like we can do several things, right? We can migrate certain things off gitlab.com as it is right now or we can add new customers onto pods, right? And say, this is how it works. Slow the growth of gitlab.com. There are several things to that may be possible, but the, I think I, Christina linked to a discussion that we had with Mike, right? There are several scenarios of like how to actually migrate people and what that would look like. And that's a, a huge undertaking. And it's probably one of the harder things to do if even if you strip out pods and you just create workspaces and you have to do that, migrate, migrating is going to be difficult, right? Um, so I don't have all the answers. He also bring this up with the import team that are working on GitLab migration now. So uh, yeah, they should probably be involved as well. Yeah, we for sure. But I think another another thing to um, and this is maybe now a more technical thing and an idealistic view of how the world could be at some point, right? It's it, pods has at least the potential, right? To be run in a multi-tenant way, right? The, for github.com, but it could also very simple, simply be used to run something like dedicated. In a way, maybe dedicated is the, the starting point for operating many pods because dedicated is a single tenant system. So you would have one, organization per pod and they get it all um, or you know maybe multiple but at least one customer you know that is associated with it but you may be able to extrapolate that to a multi-tenant system and if all of those things run on the same architecture and they all run with at least similar concepts you know of organizations then that may make things easier to like move between items and migrate them eventually, but it's very complicated. And I think Marcel, I, I can't quite remember Marcel, but this is very hard, right? And there's always intricacies. So um, it's not something where you snap a finger and it's going to be done, uh, but at least we may enter a state where our like self-managed, our multi-ten, our single-ten offerings all sort of share a lot of like underlying building blocks and that I think is quite desirable. Okay. Um, we kind of semi answered this, uh, but I'll ask anyway for the recording. Uh, does the user know what pod they're on? Is this user facing? Um, ideally, no. I don't want to talk about pods ever with customers, right? I don't want to like sell this as a um, a point to people and say like, go use GitLab because of pods. I think that is not what we want to do. Um, I think the only place where I could see this being handy is for uh, sys admins or personas that have administrative capabilities if this becomes something self-managed 
folk need to do at some point, but regular users should never really know this. We should be able to say, hey, we support regions, right? And we can offer you SLAs and disaster recovery, and they may be a consequence of having migrated to that architecture, but those are the valuable features. I think pods should be, you know, something that you can present on an engineering conf conference, but um, that's never going to be a selling point for, um, for Gitlo. It's probably sort of like the, the how we realize the things that we can offer to customers eventually, right, and the scale. Maybe I'm just <clears throat> trying to refine the question for me from the design perspective. Um, because if pods are not what we're going to expose to user, to users, we will have to expose to users some kind of concept why something is either not available or why something is um, maybe not directly shared or mm -hmm. why they're moving to something else. Um, did you already think about like taking specific examples um, if, if to-dos are something that is pod specific? Like, yeah. How would we talk about this? Yeah, so I think this goes back to the concept of an organization as we understand it, and you would be able to say your to-dos are limited to your organization. So my GitLab to-dos live in my GitLab organization, and if I then, and again, I don't know how that would look, I'm just explaining it right now, right? If you then switch into um, Fabian's contracting gig on the side, right? My to-dos would be limited to that because it's a different organization. And then, um, or we decide that aggregating to-dos across everything is really important, right? Then you would have to build some kind of capability that retrieves all of these to-dos from your different organizations, which may be on different pods. And then you would have to say in your list, for example, like this, this is a to do, it comes from this organization. And when you click on it, you get there, right? On a very high level. I, I'm not saying this is, the, this is the way to go, but you, know, you can definitely explain those things without saying, you know, this is on a different pod. You can say like this is in a different organization or workspace, right? And that's why we do it. But it's then the the word organization, not just a synonym for pod for the user? No, because an organization, a pod will have many organizations. Okay, so it's possible that if you're like, for example, on GitLab org, GitLab.com, and some of the other projects or top level groups, you have to do all in one space for there. But then if you move into three other groups, the to-dos would be aggregated across these multiple organizations? So I think this is this is why I'm talking about the, the organization space. So technically, right, if all of those organizations were on the single pod, it, nothing would stop us from aggregating them exactly in the way that we did. But mm -hmm. because of the architecture, we wouldn't make a guarantee that they these organizations live on the same pod. We may have to move them right um, at some point. And so you would you would have to scope them to this specific entity, which is an organization. Um, or you know you decide that the user experience for this is poor. People don't they want a single place to look at all of their to-dos as it is right now, and then we would have to fix it. Right. And that's not impossible in, in pods to do, but that is something that we have to actively evaluate. And that's true for, for other things as well. I would feel like there needs to be an a investigation into all the different things that need to be aggregated. Because it sounds yes. like if that list of aggregation items is too big, it could invalidate the pods proposal if there are just too many holes poked into these silos. I would probably even say another like site, like why I would have to see to those from organization GitLab if I'm working in my personal off work place. Uh, why I should see like personal stuff when I work for GitLab in the GitLab organization. Um, right now, like, just because like you have, I, I'm kind of like very, very into like the solution, but I, I think there are clear design choices to make. And like, if I work in the context of the organization, why I should see stuff from different organization when I look at that organization, why I should see to do so if I work for that specific project right now. 
there, there are like, I think, benefits for the aggregation, but there are also benefits for the separation to prevent also like the data leakage between uh, these spaces and also focusing on you on what is important. For example, I now have like 50 to-dos. Uh, most of them are from GitLab, but if I work in my personal and on weekend, I don't want to see these to-dos because I focus on something different. So <laughs> there is, a, I guess, yeah. pros and cons for both of them. <laughs> I think these are great questions for research and the validation yes. process. Yeah, I think that needs to be investigated. Like when I, I kind of like the separation in Slack, but I can also tell you, I don't go to the other places as much as I should to see what's going on there because I'm focused on GitLab. So I neglect that part. So it's actually better if it's served to me all the time so i don't forget about it yeah but so I, think, I think i think this is i think you're absolutely right that this is something that we would need to validate which i think is then the next step because i think we have assumptions about it i don't know right um but i think this is also and it and i think this goes into a a bigger discussion like we and it, and this is there's just something i'm going to put out there right i think we want to potentially as a business attract users who do their professional work on gitlab.com in uh, in spaces that um, are actually or you know that where people pay for a license in those workspaces and i i think that a user experience for example for um, a larger customer going to gitlab.com where you spend your entire week in that specific context, because this is where you do your your jobs, right? Similar to how we work in in GitLab, right? I don't go in fifteen places on GitLab.com all the time because I'm mostly focused on the things that belong to my employer, right? That may be a um, a persona and a profile, you know, that we want to go after because that is something where we see growth. However, and I think this is important to note, right? This is not necessarily the same way that people behave in open source contributions, right? And where they interact with many different projects. And that's something to figure out, right? Like, and how that would work. And I, I don't, we don't know, right? That's another piece of investigation that would need to happen. Um, because I think, I, I, like Camille said, you know, maybe this is desirable in some situations. Maybe if you have contributions to 50 open source projects that are, then in random organizations is really worse, right? That's something to figure out. Okay, we have about 10 minutes left and three questions. Let's see if we can get through that. Um, do we have any idea on how this would impact usage reporting? I mean, like usage, pain, if at all. Ish, um, I think the only discussion I had was with a fulfillment um, engineer. And I didn't really realize that usage ping data is pretty complicated at the moment because we we get instance level data from self-managed instances and we get top level group information for gitlab.com and that's all kind of hard, right? So if um, we could move, for example, the usage level ping to let's say an organization, you know, that would maybe harmonize usage data across self-managed and gitlab.com. I don't know how possible that is or if that even makes sense. I don't know. That's the only data point I have. So the answer is probably, I don't know. Um, Carly. Uh, all right. I, I think like uh, it was probably not perfect. Uh, and I, I don't think that this would also be like, um, more like iterative approach like to figure out how to scrape that i like looking at how usage pink is being done uh, my personal uh, idea would be we would simply scrape each board individually and aggregate this data uh, and this is probably how it would be implemented uh, because it's like aggregating across all pods it seems unrealistic so uh, very likely it would not affect a lot. Some data would probably be affected, but we would solve them. We would also have a very limited amount of the data that is uh, shared across both. So, but I, I think this is not like too concerning problem that we cannot solve. Um, ish, like uh, Fabian said, because uh, besides our own 
uh, needs and requirements for understanding usage in GitLab. We're also going to be offering it as part of the analytics uh, offering. As So if we are going to need data from different pods for a single organization, I can see some complexity there, but I don't want to go there because I'm not an expert. Um, Marcel, do you own analytics? I don't think so. Okay. <laughs> I would... No, it's someone else's problem. <laughs> All right, it's, I know. All right, so like, please direct to us like person that can write with us proposal yeah. on how to handle analytics. Like we would, we would greatly, we would greatly accept that and work with that person. Yeah. That I've it would be, be much easier. I've already spoken to Tim Zellman to take a look if that uh, affects uh, analytics. So uh, if he pings you, you can blame me. <laughs> That's okay. The beauty oh. of working on pods is, you know, we get pinged from many people. So I, yeah. I, I, I honestly would love like more people like to work with us on writing these proposals and affected features because like it takes significant amount of time for us like to, to decipher how these things works. So <laughs> If someone familiar with the matter would simply speed up it and be much more accurate, they would have much better answers to you and others. Yeah, well, I can relate to getting things on everything, being as mo the majority of the people here on the team have interactions with manage at some point that kind of touches everything. Um, okay, so my last question um, is that it's not really a question, it's more of a statement. Uh, we have an open discussion related supporting multiple top level groups. See how I refrain from using the terminology uh, as to not confuse people on the call. Um, and even if we do decide to support multiple top level groups, I think this is going to take a really long time to implement. So my question, which I'll try to refine right now, is this something that is an absolute requirement for pods? So I think this is this is a contentious. Um, I'll try to explain it the best I can, right? And this is, I think, maybe Christina understands the intri intricacies here better. My simplistic idea of an organization was to put it above a top level group, and then the organization would group multiple top level groups. The reason for this is that, you know, this is the example I used for um, Git, GitLab, right? We have GitLab-org, GitLab-com, they are top level groups. And I want those top level groups to be part of the same organization because that means they're on the same pod, which means everything in those multiple top level groups, you know, can essentially continue to work as, as is right now. That's, I think, the, the simple thing, but, and I think this is the, this is the sort of more of like how to get there. You know, there is this notion of what makes a top level group, a top level group, right? And right now, I think it is billing, some admin settings and a number of other things that I, um, and if we remove all of that, move it to an organization, then these groups just, become regular groups that happen to be at the top level, so to speak, you know, if there is a hierarchy and they have subgroups. So as part of the whole migration story, right, maybe, you know, there, there is, there are questions on like, will some of these top level groups just turn into an organization, right? And how would that look like? Or, you know, do you have to move certain groups into a new organization? I don't know, right? But ultimately, I, but like the end state for me would be that you have an organization and that's the that sits at the top and then you have multiple groups underneath you know and you should only have groups and subgroups and projects and at the top you know the thing that groups everything the container is an organization that's my view of it in that in that mental model how would a group differ from a subgroup i think it wouldn't at all it just okay. it just happens to be inheriting i think this is the other thing where i made that statement somewhere as long as you have this from a pod perspective that is right purely from our sort of standpoint as long as you have this container where you can say this is the the thing the things that belong together however you organize these inside that container right it's like if you 
make it a completely flat structure, or if you have inheritance, or I think that is from, from a pods architecture standpoint, doesn't really matter as much, I think. Right? But the, the container is important because that is what we need to be able to move, put somewhere, limit, you know, and that's the, the construct that, um, that I was trying to envision. Does that, does that help? It does, yeah. I think it's an important one to solve soon so we know where to place the workspace or whatever we will call the new non-workspace. I thought the name is approved. <laughs> well, not for us anymore. I think for Eric's team, it will be. Um, but uh, to build it out, I think it will be important for yes. us to where to place it, whatever we call it. I think we will not even expose it much to users. So it doesn't really matter what it is called. Organization seems to fit well. Maybe it pushes organizations mm -hmm. to actually stick within that thing for themselves instead of spinning up more. But I don't think that there's anything we can do if they decide to open up another one. No, uh, but I... And, and there might be use cases coming all the time where they say like, oh, I have two organizations now. I want to bring them together. Can you have another sure. level? So we want to avoid that. I think I think this is, and this is a data point that I, I don't have, right? I, I guess I kind, kind of do, but not really. Um, right now, uh, billing sits at the top level namespace, right? At the top level group. And it will potentially move to the organization level. So I think what would require, be required there, yes, you can make more than one organization, but if you want features like epics, you know, to exist, you will have to buy these things twice. So I think in case people want that for good reasons, right, they may consider this, but if they, I think that's the, that's the potentially limiting factor. And I don't know, I, I genuinely don't know how many customers of gitlab.com right now maintain multiple paid top level groups. They may have some free ones, right? But I, I don't know. And I, I imagine that is mostly relevant for some larger customers where they actually want some more separation. But you know, it, it makes a difference, right? If you say, like, hey, I want my, my folks to do work over here and now I need to buy a second, a second license that kind of discourages that um, behavior, I think. Potentially, but I don't know. Barry, do you want to do the closing statements? Um, yeah, so I, was, I just wanted to talk about um, like communication from pods. So we've we've been thinking about and um, and we've kind of been in a bit of a huddle working out the the first few aspects of pods, and now we're at a state where we can talk about it, not necessarily answer a lot of questions, but surface the questions. And that's that's been a great conversation, I, I think, today. Uh, going forward, um, we will be starting up um, an AMA so that there's space for questions for um, uh, for the pods group. We will <clears throat> start with a ret retrospective of kind of how we got here today. And then going forward, we'll um, kind of be showing progress um, as we go and hopefully creating some discussion points um, along the way for anybody who wants to, who's interested um, to kind of jump in and um, and ask their questions. Um, so creating that space um, for people to to ask those questions is is going to be a theme going going forward for pods. Great. Well, thank you for your patience and answering all our questions. It seems like there is a lot of unknown still and that we still need to have a lot of discussions going uh, is my conclusion. Um, but thank you. I think I understand it a little bit better. Uh, Marcella, Christina, how are you feeling, Chris? A little bit better, yeah. With a lot of Definitely more. Better. <laughs> Okay, great. So I will post this video so that others can also uh, bug you with additional questions. Um, thank you. I mean, I think positive important direction for our scalability. Uh, we do have to kind of think of implications of the existing functionality today. We're probably just one group out of everyone uh, that will be impacted. So uh, expect uh, lots more pings, I guess. We welcome that's, the questions. That's exactly yes. what we need at this point.
That's, that's, that's why we are hiring so many people to be able to answer all of these questions concurrently. <laughs> Right now, we just redirect all questions to Camille and let him figure it out, you know, so. Great. Um, so thank you and enjoy the rest of your day, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.